On the street corners and in the neighborhoods of this epicenter of multiculturalism, delicious aromas waft into the streets, tantalizing cuisines and flavors from around the world. But there's one cuisine that is loved above all in the good old US of A. There are no less than 59,000 Mexican restaurants strewn across the country. And in a quiet corner of Brooklyn, there is something special. This is Claro, the chef, TJ Steele. Claro is a Oaxacan-inspired restaurant. We do kind of a modern New York take on some Oaxacan classics. A side of rice, a blue corn tortilla, a bevy of mushrooms, homemade chorizo, fresh made cheese, a splash of spicy salsa. I know what you're thinking. Mmm, tacos. But this is not just a classic Mexican meal. Every mouthful tells the story of human history. Each of these ingredients, the grains, meats, cheeses, fruits and vegetables, reveals another chapter in our shared story. Together, they symbolize 12,000 years of innovation, invention, selection, and serendipity known as the Agricultural Revolution. For the vast majority of human existence, we were nomads. In pursuit of the next meal, our ancient ancestors roamed the earth, seeking ample game and bountiful flora. We harnessed the power of fire to cook our meals. Then, for a hundred centuries, we endured and survived a global ice age. So, how did we get from this frozen world to Taco Tuesday? Charlotte Lusty is a member of the Global Crop Trust, working in Svalbard to preserve the last 12,000 years of agricultural history. In the early years of agriculture, there were people who were understanding and learning how to cultivate wild plants. And in doing that, they cultivated plants that were delicious to eat in sufficient amounts that allowed them to develop cities and towns and, and civilizations. Whether you're talking in the Far East or Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Aztec, Inca, they were all based on brilliant farmers who were producing enough food to allow society so it was a fundamental part of our evolution as humans to become great farmers. This fertile crescent of the Middle East would come to be known as the cradle of civilization and is regarded as the birthplace of writing, trade, math, and organized religion. And all of this springs from the advent of agriculture. The success of farming meant we finally had a reason to stop our perennial wanderings and begin to settle down and try to make an honest species of ourselves. As a society becomes totally dependent on agriculture, that really does change the game. Agriculture is a tremendous blessing in the sense that it enables societies to produce a lot more food and therefore to sustain a lot more population. Where it had taken 5,000 acres to support each member of a hunter-gatherer community, the same amount of land could feed 5,000 people in an agrarian society. Agriculture provided us with a surplus of grains, vegetables, and livestock. And the population of the planet went from 5 million people 10,000 years ago to more than 7 billion today. 
agriculture it also makes possible a wider range of specialized activities. Uh, that's something you couldn't have had and you can't have in a pre-agrarian or non-agrarian society. People did not have to be directly involved in producing food. Instead, they could become craftsmen, artists, religious leaders, or chefs. Cooking is something that there was never really another choice for me. It was the only thing I ever thought that I would do or wanted to do and really enjoyed doing. I think it's hard to get authentic regional Mexican food in New York. Even in the States in general, I think people kind of clump all of Mexico's greatest hits into one. What we do here is a little different because we focus on the region of Oaxaca, which in itself has many different subregions and lots of different kind of cuisine that come together there. I think one of the things that I found when I went to Mexico was a lot more soul on the food. I felt an emotional attachment to Mexican food. I think that it spoke a lot more to my soul and what I was feeling towards food. I can take all the relationships, ideas, food experiences, everything from my time in Oaxaca and kind of just bring it here in New York and kind of share it with everyone. TJ's Oaxacan meal begins with a side of rice, the staple accompaniment to many a Mexican meal. The cuisines and civilizations of the world were shaped most influentially by the magical transformations of their native grasses. One of the great kinds of food magic is the transformation of grasses, because that's really what we're talking about. Of the great staples of the world, wheat, maize, barley, rice, all the other food sources that started as wild grasses and which humans turned into edible food and drink by cultivation, by selecting, by breeding, and have consumed now for thousands of years. Our journey through agricultural history begins in Asia, where one ingredient has always dominated the cuisine, rice. It is believed that humans have been selecting and influencing rice evolution since the Chinese first started cultivating it around 7,000 BCE. Today, rice is the primary crop and staple of more than half the world's population. While rice is our side dish, for many, rice is at the heart of every meal. I knew that was gonna happen. <laughs> hey, what's up? I'm JJ Johnson. I mean, I love to cook rice. If I had to define culture through food, I would say culture is rice. It's really at the center of the table regardless where you go in the world. Rice is a common ingredient, and then you develop that flavor profile how you want it to be based off who you are, where you're from in the world. I'm all about the mother grains of the world. There's all these rices that have fueled the world, that have like all these amazing stories to it that everybody forgot about. Despite its enduring popularity, today rice is nowhere near as varied as it once was. Most supermarkets are limited to white rice, brown rice, long grain, short grain, jasmine. And that's about it. But rice is infinitely more diverse than that. We have over 100,000 distinct varieties of rice. That would be the highest diversity of any of the plant kingdom. And almost no one gets to experience it. If you're into flavor, like I am, the more diversity, the better. Glenn Roberts is the founder of Anson Mills, a company dedicated to the cultivation and preservation of grains and seeds from bygone eras. From the black tribute rice used to pay taxes to Chinese emperors, all the way to the grandfather of long rice in the Americas, 
Carolina Gold. We are first and foremost rice people. What I have here, this is a ton of Carolina Gold rice seed, and uh, this is our production rice and our main thing that we do. Bottom line is extraordinary rice. One of the most beautiful foods you can imagine. We have lots of different rices. We only grow heirloom grains. All of our plants are from eras all the way back to the dawn of civilization. One of the grains we work with is 22,000 years old, supposedly on carbon dating. Those foods are spectacular, and part of what we've been doing is trying to bring them back. It's hard work and it's really exacting work, but it's also very, very rewarding. Glenn has spent the last two decades working with scientists to bring heirloom and ancient grains back to our dinner tables. There's a big cognition now in modern times of the fact that heirlooms are important because in old crops, land race and heirloom crops, flavor equals nutrition. So you're looking for the highest flavor. This might not even fit in here. <laughs> Rice is everything. It is truly what I feel is the most casual, common ingredient in the world. And I think since it's so casual, we all forget that it really fuels our soul. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a king, a president, a maid, a chef. Rice is just something that we all know. This beautifully engineered grain of grass remains the staple of dinners around the world. On to the main course. Today we're going to be cooking some mamelas on the kamal. The base of our historic meal, the tortilla, is made of another grass, which has towered in importance throughout Central American history. Maize or corn. One of the first things that I noticed getting to Oaxaca was the quality of the corn and the masa. Even just a, a tortilla is like super satisfying. It's kind of how people would talk about like a great French baguette or a croissant or something. You're like, wow, if you haven't had that corn before, I don't know that you've ever had <laughs> the proper experience with a tortilla. Maize was the foundation of the great empires of Central America including the Aztecs of Mexico and the Inca of Peru. The oldest remains left from a meal of maize were found in the Tehuacan Valley of Mexico. The tiny ears had been gnawed on over 5,000 years ago. When farmers took wild plants and developed things that they could eat in large quantities, they had to leave behind certain aspects of the wild species that weren't so helpful. So they had to keep selecting plants until they had what was useful to them. It's a similar thing that's happened in, in human evolution because human diversity is not very great. And what is absolutely astounding is there's probably more genetic diversity in a field of traditional maize varieties than there is in the entire human race. Maize is derived from a grass called teosinte, which is indigenous to central Mexico. The difference between teosinte and modern maize is remarkable. With human help, this humble plant evolved as bigger ears with fatter kernels were selected and planted. And corn or maize has never waned in its importance to Central America. Familiar.
Entonces, es, eh, pues tiene miles de años que pues, se sigue produciendo maíz como la base alimentaria de, de los mexicanos. To the civilizations of Central America, maize was both the source of life and the reason for living. It was food, economy, nutrition, and flavor all in one. The Mayans didn't just subsist on maize, they came from maize. The Aztecs and their gods exchanged their most precious possessions human hearts for the heart of corn. The basic rule, I think, is very easily understood. The food which, which feeds you most, so, so that becomes your god. That's the, that's the food that you, you have to acknowledge, that you have to be grateful to. De alguna manera, este, pues lo único que podemos hacer es darle gracias a Dios por la bondad que nos da de la producción de, de maíz. Es parte de la soberanía alimentaria ¿no? de México, de Oaxaca. Entonces eh, es algo que debemos conservar como, como un legado que nos dejaron nuestros antepasados. ¿no? Since corn in Oaxaca has always been such a staple part of the diet and the culture here, there might be a little bit more respect for it. I haven't been able to find any corn in the States that comes close to anything that's going on down here in Mexico as far as flavor and starch content and even aroma. Everything that we're looking for at the restaurant is in the corn that we find down here. The ancient practice of soaking and boiling corn with white lime releases amino acids and vitamin B and makes it easier to grind. El primer paso es ya teniendo ya el maíz cocido, lo machacamos con el nosotros llamamos el la mano. This difficult process is necessary in the quest for the building block of every great Mexican meal, masa. And from masa, the tortilla. Es pesado porque sí necesita mucha fuerza para poder llegar a, a tener ya la masa. TJ is making a thick and hearty mamela. But for the common taco, the tortilla is king. And in a year, the average Mexican consumes around 185 pounds of them. The difference between something you would buy at a store and something that we're making here with no preservatives or additives to it is, is huge. Like you can smell the difference, feel it, taste it, everything across the board. It can be fried, it can be cooked dry in a comal, it can be finished on a grill. You can see it in all different shapes, from tortillas, clayudas, mamelas, all kinds of things. The possibilities are endless, masa is life. Thanks to millennia of progress, we now have a steaming side of rice and a blue corn mamela. Stable food sources, rich in carbohydrates and vitamins, changed the game. But the grass wasn't necessarily greener at first. When ancient people diverged from their hunter-gatherer diets and became dependent on a stable diet of great grasses, they began to pay a devastating biological price. I mean, there's no progress without a kickback from fate. I mean, that's life, right? <laughs> and in the case of agriculture, in every early case of a society, it made them dependent on a single staple or a very limited range of staples. 
They were more rickety, they were shorter, they were feebler than their Paleolithic predecessors who had relied on wild food. The fossil record reveals that humans' nutritional health declined as a direct result of this homogenized diet. Eating only grains every day gave early farmers cavities and periodontal disease, conditions rarely found in hunter-gatherers. Despite the challenges, people didn't want to give up their new lifestyle. The diets of early farm dwellers diversified as the art of cultivation and domestication was honed. Grains were not agriculture's only gift. As we settled, hunters became herders. Herd animals like cows, goats, sheep, pigs, horses and camels provided easy access to protein through meat. Not only are people using these animals for food, they're creating new species by selecting from the wild varieties, keeping them together in one place, breeding from them, producing ever bigger specimens for more food, more nutritional value. And that's what changes the pattern of evolution. Humans are beginning to produce species that would not have existed and could not survive without human intervention. Cattle were first domesticated in the early Neolithic period simultaneously in both the Middle East and parts of Eastern Europe. Wild chickens indigenous to India and East Asia were domesticated around 7,000 years ago. and pigs descended from the Eurasian wild boar. Domestication led to culinary experimentation, allowing our love of meat to take on new forms and flavors. Grilled meat's really popular in Oaxaca, you'll see Traveling through the markets and stuff, there'll be a lot of little stands set up that might be a little old lady on the corner grilling up some meat and putting it on top of tortillas. You'll see a lot of stews or tacos de cozuela. These like beautiful earthenware pots that are full of stews and kind of pick what you want and they'll fill tortillas with it. Ocho piezas. Right now we're looking at some chorizo, a Oaxacan style. This chorizo has tons of flavor. TJ takes inspiration from the markets of Oaxaca and brings it to the tables of Brooklyn. Using better quality meats here has yielded us a product that reminds me more of food in Oaxaca because I think that they're all one step closer to the farm. So here I'm stirring up our uh, house-made chorizo. And basically it's heritage pork meat, which is like an heirloom pork meat that we grind in-house. And then we're adding in guajillos from Mexico which is what it gets all of its nice red color from. And then for spices, it's getting Mexican oregano, thyme, allspice, a little bit of cumin, some white vinegar, a little sugar and salt, and that's it. This spicy Mexican favorite will be the centerpiece of TJ's mamela. But there are more stories to be told by this dish. As a species, our love affair with cheese predates recorded human history. Now we're going to add a little bit of farm cheese that we make in-house. Basically, it's um, a fresh cheese or almost like a ricotta-style cheese. And this is also something that's very typical to Mexico or Oaxaca. Cheese is thought to have originated when milk curdled while being transported in bladders made of the ruminant stomachs of cattle. It was love at first bite. Introduced to Europe by travelers from Asia and to the New World by the pilgrim settlers, today, cheeses from around the world differ wildly in their preparation and flavor. It comes aged, stinky, creamy, soft, hard, 
and moldy. We make all of our own cheeses in house. I think that you can taste the difference. You can taste the love and the care in it, and it really shows. This is a chorizo mamela with some asiento bean paste, and then a house-made chorizo and potato with some fresh cheese on top and cilantro. Our first dish is up, but this Oaxacan feast isn't done yet. As tasty as they are, we cannot survive on meats and cheeses alone. There's a reason your parents always told you to eat your vegetables. Not only are they delicious, they're the cornerstone of nutrition. From apples to mangoes, onions to avocados, peppers to chilies, cultivation of regional fruits and veggies was essential to culinary culture. Going to Oaxaca and seeing the food down there kind of blew my mind how much flavor you can get out of something like a mushroom. These flavors can take you back to the earth. For the veggie lovers, TJ is preparing his famous mushroom and pea shoot mamela. I think mushrooms are fun because they kind of have the meatiness without having meat in them. These are all wild mushrooms now that are in season. I like these mushrooms too because they all have a different texture and color. Pink oyster, the bluefoot, some of the cauliflower, the peopinis, and. And it wouldn't be complete without the spicy crowning glory, salsa. All these different vegetables come together as one. It's always a balance of sweet, salty, savory, acidic, really can bring a dish together. Though salsa is a seemingly simple condiment, this mix of veggies, fruits, and spices actually dates back through the ages of the Incas. Aztecs and Mayans. Aztec lords combined tomatoes with chili, ground squash seeds and legumes. And the Spaniards first encountered salsa in the 15th century. First on the shopping list for our salsa, tomatoes. This is a Zapotec tomato. The first time I ever had this tomato was in Oaxaca, and I thought that it was just a weird-looking little funky tomato, but just like we have heirloom tomatoes back home, this is basically what that is here. This species of the fruit family originated here in Central America. Tomatoes were first exported in the 1500s. These colorful fruits were introduced across the continent of Europe and notably Italy. It's hard to imagine Italian food without tomatoes. But they didn't become a staple of the cuisine until around 1880, with the invention of the margarita pizza in Naples. This heirloom tomato will be the base. The next ingredient for our salsa, onions. These are knob onions, or in the States we call them spring onions, but Basically, it's like an onion before it develops. It's like harder skin on the outside, so it's much sweeter and has a lighter flavor, I guess. And they're really good to like cook on the grill and serve on the side of some tacos, or I like to just kind of munch them on their own once they're grilled. They're really awesome. Onions are rich in vitamin C, mineral salts, and antioxidants. Their beneficial effects were understood as early as the building of the pyramids. Egyptian mummies were even accompanied into the afterlife with stocks of onions wrapped in bandages. Most of the work is done, but a good Oaxacan salsa needs one last very important thing, a kick. The stand is pretty cool. It's a lot of different herbs and spices and a lot that you would see in um, traditional Oaxacan food. Some dry oregano and some cumin and all spices also. A stall like this is really cool because you can really smell all the spices and stuff. And I don't know, it kind of takes you back in time if you want to think about like a spice trade or something like that. 
piles of cool ingredients. It's awesome. I'm kind of making a freestyle salsa today and just taking some ingredients I like and mixing them together. One of the things I really enjoy coming down here is like how these tomatoes are always super sweet and ripe and super amazing. And I think it's one of the things that makes all the salsas and things here really special. I just want a little bit more char in them and then also, as you see, like how they're bubbling here and kind of shrinking up. What's happening is the water is cooking out and that's intensifying the flavors. Almost like a sun-dried tomato would be. And uh, I'm basically gonna mash up the tomatoes with a little bit of this chili paste, which is made from Oaxacan Casilla chili, which is a nice smoky chili, kind of like a chipotle. So it's gonna add a little bit of acid from the tomatillo and some smokiness and heat from the chili. I think this might be done. Yeah, I'm just gonna add a little salt to this and that's kind of perfect. In every little bite, TJ tells a great big story. It took 12,000 years, but our meal is finally complete. Okay, let's eat. Each taco represents the story of agricultural selection, invention, experimentation, and hard work. From antiquity to modern day, humans have bent the environment to our will and overseen the evolution and domestication of plants and animals. It was the ingredients provided by agriculture that inspired appreciation of flavors. But what good was producing a surplus of food if it couldn't all be consumed or traded? We needed to preserve or die. And agrarian life taught us another valuable lesson. The alchemy of fermentation and food preservation. Methods that fueled an age of exploration that would change the world forever.